Excuse me, little dragon. Hi, right, guys. Well, it is a lovely mid-October evening here in early September here, and the collapse of everything at Bugs in a Jar Farm, uh, where we have made it to Labor Day. Labor Day. Good Lord. The party is over. The summer of 2024 party is over, and uh, it is feeling like fall uh, here on Monday evening, September 2nd, 2024. Sandy was claiming that she's hearing a chance of frost tomorrow night on September 3rd. Who knows? But anyway, now that the party is over and I've got my life back here at Bugs in a Jar Farm, I can uh, just do what I do every day. I, I'm torn between two things. I think I'm going to save <clears throat> the enshittification of everything. We'll come back to the enshittification of everything. Because today we are going to go to the uh, <coughs> the essay from Medium.com that introduced me to the enshittification of everything. So this will be the lead-in to it. Uh, this is from this fellow named Eric Michaels, who have, I have. Uh, I have read several of Eric Michael's fine Doomer essays from Medium.com. This is actually six weeks old, just now showing up in my feed for some reason. I was going to save this for the lead-off article of my Ain't Gonna Happen Roundup rant on Friday night, but I think it uh, stands on its own. So we're just going to have like a Monday night ain't going to happen. We're going to let Eric Michaels tell us about the solution obsession. Okay, Eric, I, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I'll read most of it. And uh, th this is one of the great quotes. Uh, I really wish when people would quote things, they would put the year. This is from Aldo Leopold. So maybe this quote was a hundred years old. You know, Aldo Leopold was a, a writer and an ecologist. Take it away, Aldo. <clears throat> One of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on the land is quite invisible to laymen. An ecologist, now otherwise known as a doomer, an ecologist must either harden his shell and make believe that the consequences of science are none of his business, or he must be the doctor who sees the marks of death in a community that believes itself well and does not want to be told otherwise. Thank you, uh, Aldo, for reading my mind. That really sums up uh, hopium addicts and apocalyptimists in uh, one sentence. As I say, I'm guessing Maybe uh, that quote's a hundred years old. So now we're going to get into Eric Michael's uh, essay. The obsession over solutions never seems to go away. I have detailed many times over the past, almost four years now, precisely why what we face is a set of symptom predicaments under a root predicament. The root 
predicament, not the problem, is ecological overshoot and symptom predicaments or items such as climate change, pollution, energy, and resource decline, also known as peak oil, biodiversity loss, extinction, and all other environmental issues that are typically called problems, but which in reality have no, no solutions because they are not actually problems. We, meaning 99% of humans, uh, maybe not including a few doomers, we like to think that we have solutions. We like to think that we have solutions by applying science to utilize technology to solve problems and for things that are in actuality problems, it is possible to solve them in a reductionistic manner by ignoring the environmental degradation that comes along with building such technology, operating it, maintaining the infrastructure supporting it, and decommissioning said technology at the end of its service life and either scrapping it or replacing it. But while the original problem may appear to have been solved, brand new problems or even predicaments spring up in its place as a result of this process. This is why so-called solutions are really nothing more than bargaining. More often than not, they are bargaining to maintain civilization. More often than not, yeah, like 99% of times. Because civilization, and I would put in the word itself, because civilization itself is unsustainable, attempting to maintain it is not only impossible, but foolhardy as well. Industrial civilization is collapsing as I write this, although since collapse is a long process and not an overnight event, we can expect it to limp along, to limp along for quite some time yet, possibly another quarter century. Much of this has to do with optimism bias and denial of reality, not being able to see technology from a complete perspective instead of seeing only its positive attributes. So, I have repeated everything I've already said here many times. Tom Murphy has a new video series he is doing on YouTube, and uh, he has links to, uh, I need to check out Tom Murphy's new uh, series of videos on YouTube. And it goes into great detail about all of this. William E. Reese has painstakingly said this many, many, many times as well and lays everything out. And then he uh, links to over uh, to a William Reese video. I could go on and on, but needless to say, it really is way past time to move towards acceptance of actuality and stop with the magical thinking. And uh, anybody who heard my uh, Ain't Gonna Happen Roundup rant where I was calling Bill Reese to task for acting like the political process had a chance in hell 
of turning this train around. Okay, where I find found myself calling out William Reese, what do I find right here? You know, I was look I, I was reading Bill Reese's article in Resilience uh, org where he went off on this happy horseshit hopium uh, at the end. Last week I delved into Reese's article on resilience.org. He pointed to a possibility of a political solutions. Word to Bill Reese. There are no political solutions and never will be. The system is not set up for reality, as Bill Reese knows damn well. The system is not set up for reality. It is set up to tell people what they want to hear. Make America great again. Telling people things does not actually accomplish anything and because we don't truly live in democracies but in oligarchies, as Bill Reese knows as well as anybody, where the corporations more or less dictate the system, politicians can make whatever claims they want. If the corporations don't like it, whatever it may be, then it just, he says, isn't going to happen. But obviously, uh, as uh, I would say, if the corporations don't like it, then it just ain't gonna happen. And uh, I, Eric knows this. I know this. This blue dragon knows this. And Bill Reese knows goddamn well that it ain't going to happen. <clears throat> Once again, as much as I hate saying it, because I don't like the implications any more than anyone else does, we lack agency. This word agency, uh, you're going to see a lot from the, uh, from the hopium smokers. This idea that we actually have control is almost hilarious. I, it makes me think of that, uh, that classic uh, Terrence McKenna video, Nobody is in Control, uh, where, what was it, over 30 years ago, uh, Terrence McKenna looking at the situation and the oligarchy and the whole bit unfolding on this planet 30 years ago and, and laughing off the notion that anybody is in control of uh, the system as it stood 30 years ago. This idea that we actually have control is almost hilarious. Before we built all these systems of civilization that require energy and resource throughput just to maintain themselves, perhaps we did have a modicum of control. We could limit ourselves. Yep, uh -huh. we could limit ourselves, which before we worshiped technology use, actually had an effect. But now that we depend upon civilization for our living arrangements in order to keep the water and sewage and gas and electricity and internet service and TV and radio stations and traffic and business and food and garbage collection flowing, these systems require a massive amount of energy to maintain. These systems cannot just be stopped all of a sudden in order to discontinue using fossil fuels because everyone depends upon them. 
I pointed out much of this uh, in a previous article, and he has links to all of this other stuff. That is a fox. If you can hear that weird noise, that is a fox joining in on this rant. I pointed much of this out in, in, in a previous article, but many people still believe in the fairy tale story of electrification, which really changes nothing. It does not make life more sustainable. In fact, it only doubles down on unsustainability. Attempting to power civilization by alternate means. When one realizes the truth about the electrical grid, the whole idea of trying to build out a new system guaranteed to fail seems quite ludicrous. Unfortunately, that is what all these solutions are all about. Attempting to maintain the civilization we are all embedded within, which cannot be maintained. Even degrowth advocates want to try incrementalism to, the, to resolve the issues we face. I'll give them credit, at least they aren't pushing for more growth, generally speaking. Many of them still are not ready to begin reducing their use of technology, and that is where the whole idea pretty much fails. Unfortunately, what most people think of degrowth is that they will simply use a little less or cut out a few things here and there. They don't appear to understand that their entire lifestyle will be turned upside down and inside out. Because society did not do this 50 years ago, the situation has only grown exponentially worse. Collapse was always a given. Even back then, a species cannot go into overshoot and not collapse. Despite that simple fact, here we go again uh, with yet another book about fixing civilization and making it sustainable and he links you to some book. I, I won't even insult your intelligence. You know, the number of books coming out with this hopium peddling about how we're going to save this civilization uh, by making it sustainable, it really makes me want to puke. I guess I won't waste my time reading that book. I will, however, give them kudos for bringing ideas to the forefront on how to bring light to the issue of sustainability, as I do think highlighting these things at least gets folks to think about them, even if based on faulty premises. Uh, here's yet another prime example of more hype about electrification and non-renewable re, non-renewable renewable devices uh, anyway guys and, and he goes off I, I mean I could just make this uh, part of my ain't gonna happen he, he's just pulling one example out of his ain't gonna happen it's talking about powering Africa with renewable energy power Africa. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned to witness 
the beginning of a pan-African renewable energy movement and register for their launch. Color me surprised that when I go to their website, the very first thing I am bombarded with is their fundraising efforts. Accepting, accepting that people are going to believe what they want to believe regardless if those beliefs are possible or not, I have to simply walk away from magical and wishful thinking. The belief that humans can fix what we have screwed up is at odds with reality in my mind. It really is reductionism at its finest. Take a look at lands that used to be forest and turned into agricultural land. Nature abhors a vacuum, so if the land is left alone, eventually it will become forest again, provided climate change does not render the area desert. A definite probability in arid regions. Still, the soil that once existed there will take a long time to be like it was before the trees were all cut down and the land cleared and plowed. Generally, the trees will require about half a century to have the same carbon sequestering ability that the previous forest had before it was cut down. This is if most of the trees survive, which is highly unlikely. I wrote this article about trees quite some back, and it delineates how trees will never be able to sequester enough carbon to overcome anthropocentric emissions, never mind emissions from positive feedback mechanisms such as methane from reservoirs, permafrost, wildfires, and hydrates. Needless to say, while we can do things to improve the quality and biodiversity of the soil, it is highly unlikely that said soil will ever contain all of the qualities that it had before we started screwing around with it, thinking that we knew best what was needed with agriculture. We were reminded by Carl Sagan about belief. This is a child of the Finger Lakes of New York. The late, great Carl Sagan. Again, I wish I had the year for this. Take it away, Carl. You cannot convince a believer of anything for their belief is not based on evidence, it is based on a deep-seated need to believe. Can you say, make America great again? Satan also reminded us of, Char of Charlton's, is it Charlton or Charlton? I've heard that word pronounced uh, both ways. I'm going to go with Charlton. One, quoting uh, Sagan again, one of the sadded, saddest lessons of history is this. If we have been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We are no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It is simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we have been taken. Make America great again. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. Moving on, I understand the obsession with solutions as I see articles like this. And then he goes and uh, goes off 
I'm, I'm going to skip over this. I think this is one about, you know, some article about some sort of fungus, some sort of mushroom or mold. You know, we've, we've all heard uh, the, the mushrooms are going to save the planet. And I'm not talking about the psilocybins, uh, which maybe are going to uh, save the planet. Uh, I I anyway, uh, jumping ahead. So, I get that people, I guess he's talking about doomers at this point, so I get that people are worried, and they have every right to be, because we are suffering from overshoot. However, we must do things that reduce overshoot rather than increase it. Anything that promotes technology, technology use, or civilization is going the wrong way because those types of ideas will increase overshoot rather than reduce it. This is precisely why governments and politicians, you know, that Bill Reese wants us to educate, utterly have no agency to help, and to be able to help in tackling overshoot because to do so means the end of their careers their jobs, and everything that made them who they now are. Can you say, make America great again? Uh, then he quotes a long poem, which I'm not going to repeat. Much to think about and consider Let's quit wasting our time and energy looking for so-called solutions, in parentheses, and shitification, and instead get busy figuring out how to live in a sustainable manner. Ain't gonna happen, Eric. Knowing full well that we cannot escape the consequences of overshoot. Until next time, live now. Get out there and enjoy it while you still can. And uh, But we're going to pick up with his link to the article uh, on the enchitification of everything. Cory Doctorow invented the perfect word for our time of collapsing completely. So what do you think? All right. Uh, this blue dragon has a bulge in its belly about the size of my little dog. Maybe I should go uh, find out what happened to my little dog. Get out there and enjoy the enchitification of everything while you still can. Bye, guys. Uh, wee! <laughs> oh, man. Darkness falls over the deep forest. Uh, you know, so he was talking about trees taking about 50 years. Uh, you know, this entire forest that bugs in a jar was... Th this was... Uh, Pretty much, probably sheep pasture about a hundred years ago. So I don't know 
how old these big old maple trees. That's a big old cherry tree. Uh, so all of this forest and most of the forest in the Finger Lakes has grown back over the past hundred years. And now all the trees are dying again. And so it goes. All right. I'm going to hang out in Blue Dragon Tiny House on this gorgeous night, this gorgeous chilly fall night, and enjoy some peace and quiet at Bugs in a Jar Farm to close out summertime. Bye, guys.